to bring us together. Oh, that matter, what a blessing. I mean, this medium has been, I mean, Lord knows, let's see, three, four years. I mean, Lord, you have been moving by your spirit. I just thank you for even being a part of these wonderful people on this call. Amen. At this insane time in the morning, <laughs> move by your spirit, speak to our hearts. You know, I got some stuff written down. I think I got what you told me, but Lord, you change whatever. You just in charge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to uh, talk some more about this Exodus stage. And, you know, as I was praying about morning manna this morning, the Lord just impressed upon me that I need to really emphasize an element about the Exodus stage. I mean, this has been really, well, enlightening. It's funny how sometimes you think you know something and then you know a verse or you know a, something and then God just he takes you, so you say, wow, I didn't even see that before. And that's what I've been experiencing because I think one of the things that we need to understand that the Exodus is a, it's a departure as the term Exodus means. And, uh, it's really about a season, a see, a time, as is the case with all of the historical age. There is something God is doing, something that God is uh, producing. And uh, but one of the things God impressed upon me that we need to keep utmost in our minds is that. The Exodus period is really about how a group of people left Egypt and how they never arrived. A whole generation of people came out of Egypt, but they never got to the promised land. I mean, they... Uh, I guess the great message of Exodus period that I need you to, to keep in mind is the fact that um, there's a danger that you can get out but not go in. That it's like you can escape bondage but never enter into freedom. I mean, that's the that there's an incompleteness about the Exodus period because you have this great potential, this that's never realized, this opportunity, wonderful opportunity that they did not avail themselves of. And for all they had going for them, and for all that God intended for them. In the final analysis, they came up short. Um, ultimately, they missed out on what God wanted to do for them. I mean, that is something that we have to keep in mind about the Exodus. There's a lot that goes on. A lot that happens. God is so active in the Exodus period. But the thing that is impactful is this place that was supposed to be a transitional place. See, the wilderness was supposed to be a place they passed through to get to the promised land. It was not the destination. It was the path. It was the road. It was the means. It was, it was the place where they died. It was the place where the journey ended. It was the place where they uh, ultimately ended up. And the reason why I want to emphasize this is because the whole reason for why they didn't make it was because they, uh, 
they did not learn. They did not understand that Exodus was about learning something. It was about getting equipped. It was about getting prepared. It was supposed to be where they got what they needed so they could be set up for the promise. I mean, and it really helped me to, I was, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how you can't think of the Exodus without thinking of it as a process. That the wilderness experience was a process that was intended to bring them in a place where they could inherit the promise. And the great failure that we study in Exodus is how they, how they, uh, they didn't make it. I mean, we gotta all think about that. It's not just about being blessed, not just about being in the family of God. We have to think of all of our lives this way. That is not just the fact that I'm I'm a child of God. No, there's a reason why God saved you. And God brought you out of darkness and he intended to bring you into his marvelous light. Now, Hebrews, the uh, fourth chapter, it says this, it says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. He's talking about the children of Israel. And then my favorite one is 1 Corinthians 10th chapter. And uh, I'm going to read just first through the fifth verse. Because this right here really embodies what I'm trying to communicate. He says, moreover, brother, I would not have you to be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drunk of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. But they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, there were, these were our examples. In other words, the great lesson is that we don't follow in that same path. Now, I want to suggest to you that the most prevalent outcome is that people get in the Lord, they get out of darkness, they never come into what God intended for them to have. For whatever reason, that is what we must be really, really cognizant of. I like uh, in Hebrews, um, Get the verse, but it says, let us therefore fear. Not fear in the sense of being afraid, but fear in the sense of reverence. Greek word that means reverence. In other words, be attentive, be, uh, be on guard, pay special attention. He says, let us therefore be very conscientious that a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you come short of it. I mean, for unto us the gospel was preached as well as in them, but the word preached did not profit them. Think about that. That you can get a word and the word not benefit you. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Or we which have believed to enter into the rest. And, and he said, as I've sworn in my wrath, they shall not, they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the work. And if you look at Hebrews 3.10, let me just read one more. It says, therefore, I was grieved with that generation. He said, they do always err. 
and said they do they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I want to emphasize to you that the exit stage is about one thing, learning, learning, learning what you need to know in order to enter into the promised land. That, that, that what you learn is going to determine whether you die in the wilderness or whether you enter into the promised land. And I think it's important that we need to understand that spiritual progress is tied. It's tied to the acquisition of knowledge, not just any knowledge, but the special knowledge that God wants you to have. Like enlightenment, for example, being enlightened is the measure of advancement spiritually. We have to tie spirituality to the attaining of the necessary knowledge that you need. All of us went to school and we know you can go to school and not learn nothing, okay? You can sit through a class, you can, can read the material, but afterwards not have learned what you were there for. Comprehension and understanding are not merely related to a mental mind thing, but it has everything to do with a move of God. God is moving in your life to the degree to which you're learning. We got to make learning a spiritual exercise. It is the spiritual exercise. Okay? There's nothing spiritually taking place if you're not learning. It's really sad that church has become everything but what it was intended to be. And that is a learning institution. The church is a place where you come and learn about God. It's great if you can have fellowship. It's great if you can get, you know, friends. Y'all can work on different things. I mean, it's great that you help the community. That's all wonderful, well and good. But the main thing that you're supposed to happen at church is you are to learn about God because God is inherently a revelatory being and it is by him revealing himself to you that you experience him in his fullness. And so we need to realize that the pursuit of insight, the pursuit of truth is the pursuit of God. And if you're not pursuing truth, you're not pursuing God. Do you hear me? And, you know, spirituality is only attainable to the degree to which you are actively engaged in the process of learning. And I mean this literally in the sense that the term disciple, if you look up the term disciple, it means learner, somebody who's coming to learn, all right? And, and there is some acquired knowledge, some very significant information, some um, development of some skill that God is actively seeking to bring you into because he has plans for you. And so it's so important to understand that because spiritual development is the result. It's the result of educational effectiveness process. Advancement is when there is instruction, okay? I didn't go so far as say that spiritual 
spiritual truth is really indoctrination. You really are getting changed in how you think and how you are. I know we typically think of the term brainwashing in a negative way, and I'm not denying that because you don't want nobody brainwashing. But I'm sorry, real spiritual crisis and what God was doing in Egypt was he was literally seeking to do a process of indoctrination where he was changing how they thought, how, you know, it's like God puts you through a process where he can change completely the way you think so that you can be compatible with being in relationship with him. So you can be usable in the sense that you become functional and that you can be healed so that you're not, you're not broken anymore. You're not, you're not damaged. You're not motivated by, by hurt or avoidance of pain. I mean, the exodus has got to be seen as a period of godly conditioning. That's the good word, conditioning. It's like, it's like it was a journey. It was a trip, but it was more than that. It was really, it was a re-education, okay? It, it was, it was, you know, we talk about the word conversion. That's what conversion is. Conversion is a change in the way you think and the way that you are. I mean, some of y'all have been in the military or some of y'all even in the military now. Uh, y'all would, not, didn't you, when y'all first went into the military, they took you through what they call boot camp or they call it uh, basic training. And boy, let me tell you, you know what they were doing? Is they was training you to be a soldier. And everybody got to go to boot camp. I mean, nobody can avoid it. I mean, you know, everybody has to go through uh, this heavy training to get you into the mindset that I am a warrior. I'm a fighter. I got to be tough. I got to be disciplined. I got to be orderly. I have to develop team. I have to realize that I'm, it's not me individually, but I'm working with group and then they they put you through a heavy process a lot of people don't make it a lot of people fall out a lot of a lot of them realize wait a minute here I'm, I'm not up to this this is not me this ain't something I can handle because you got to be mentally tough because before you can be what you call a soldier in the United States Army or any army you have to be changed and go through this shaping process, this training process. Well, that's what you got to think about when you think about the wilderness experience as being a place where God was getting them ready. It's sad a lot of them didn't make it, but the same way in which God took them through this process is the same way God takes us in our lives through the process. And whether you want to admit it or not, you are the product of what you have been through. You are the product of what you have experienced. And I know a lot of times, you know, we always look for a good time. We look for things to be easy. And, you know, we look for ways to have less stress, less pressure. But how many know some of the best things are? Uh, come from some of the most uncomfortable conditions. I mean, one of the reasons why you're so close to God is because you went through some things where you learned that he was your only hope. I mean, your closeness to God didn't come from being in ideal situations. Your greatest praise comes from how God blessed you to show you how much he loved you in times 
where there was no one else you could turn to. I'm going to tell you the most impactful things are the things that came through very unfortunate circumstances. But they say a pearl is the result of an irritation in the plant. It's an irritation. And that irritation develops into something valuable. Like a and diamond. A diamond is the result of intense pressure and heat. That process produces this glistening, shining. It's the hardest uh, mineral on earth. But it comes at a price. And uh, I love like so many times in the Bible, God uses the smelting process, talks about, you know, the heat. See, because when you get, let's say you get like metal, like steel or something like that, it don't come out the ground looking like that. It looks like a rock. It looks like something that's worthless. Okay, gold, when you see raw gold, you say to yourself, that ain't worth nothing. But what happens is they put it in a smelting process. And after they put the, apply that heat to it, it burns off all the impurities and then it comes forth. And then the, the real gold connects as a result of the heat. And, and the rest of it is burned away. And that's how you get that shot. That's, that's what Peter's talking about. And uh, is it first Peter? Uh, one and uh, seven, he says that the trial of your faith being much more precious or valuable than gold that perishes through it, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, a lot of people want to have the anointing, right? But uh, the anointing comes as a result of a process. And uh, olive, olive oil doesn't, olive oil isn't olive juice. Olive oil is the oil that comes from the skin. The only way you can get the oil out of the skin is you have to crush the olive. You have to press down an olive and what emits from the skin of the olive is the oil in the same way you can't have the anointing without some crushing i'm gonna tell I'm, I'm, I'm just I got, i'm gonna get to my other point in a minute but i want to say like i let me read one more verse for you I love this verse. Isaiah 54 and 16. It says this, Behold, I have created the smith. God said, I'm, I'm, I created that. I uh, developed a strategy. The smith that bloweth the coals on the fire. <laughs> that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I mean, he, he's like, you think you're going through hell, but all I'm doing is I am preparing and making you an instrument. Amen. To have created the waster to destroy. And that was, I'm behind it. And it's not about what's happening. As much as it about my process. And I know we always like to say, no weapon formed against you a process. Every tongue should rise up. But that's the verse before that. You got to look at that verse in the context of, of, of what he says prior to that. Because what he's basically saying is, look, um, this evil that you are coming in contact these people that are doing these things to you, this uh, uncomfortable process, I want you to know I'm behind it. I am doing this in order to make you instrumental, to make you 
useful to make you where I need you to be. And after I'm finished, I do something with the, re the, the waster. He said, look, I'm, I'm gonna take care of them. I, I, I'll, I'll handle them. Don't worry about them. I got them. But right now I'm using them. And he says, in the final analysis, everything they're doing shall not harm you. As a matter of fact, I will carry out retribution. I will bring vindication. Everything they're doing is not going to be beneficial to them. It's going to be to their demise. But I need you to realize, don't worry about them. You just focus on my process. Because in the next verse, he says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness. Righteousness. You know what righteousness is? Righteousness is right standing. Appropriate posturing. Righteousness is when you get lined up right in the proper position for God to manifest himself through you. What makes gold so valuable is the fact that it's pure. To purify you, there has to be fire. There has to be the smith you know, you ain't useful till we get the stuff burned out of you. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is I need you to think in terms of learning, okay? I need you to understand that it's all about teaching. You know, the ministry of Jesus was first and foremost all about instruction, okay? It was about education, it was about the transmission of truth. The Great Commission says, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. What, what, what's the Great Commission? Teaching. So many churches are not teaching. So many ministers are doing everything but the main thing, teaching. The description of the ministry of Jesus was mainly instruction. And uh, Matthew 4.23 says, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And I want you to notice the order of that. See, it is as a result of the instruction that the miraculous power of God can be manifest. What's the problem in the body of Christ? People are not being taught. That accounts for the absence of the move of God. We're trying to get miracles and we don't have instruction. We don't have understanding. You know, we... It's the saddest commentary on any ministry is when people are not learning. The quality of my ministry or any ministry is found on how much you learn. And it's not impressive how engaged you are, how many participants you have, how many activities, how much work. The question is, is anybody in here learning anything? <laughs> you know, so they've been in church for 30 years and they ain't learned nothing over that period of time. I mean, I'm glad they're going to go to heaven. But a lot of people, when they get to heaven, they're going to be like really surprised because they're going to get to heaven and find out that all this stuff they could have known, they ain't know. Life was so much harder. I mean, they had such a hard time because ain't nobody never tell them that they did not have to be like, because nobody taught them. And I'm going to tell you something. Like I said, that's, that's how I judge myself. My main criteria that I'm be judged on is how much 
did you learn? When I stand before God, that's what he's going to ask me. And, and I don't want to fail at that because that's the main thrust of ministry is to provide you with what you need to know so you can understand, fully discern significance so that you can comprehend what's accurate and decipher between error and truth. The effectiveness of any ministry is how many light bulbs go off. You got to have light bulb moments when you are when you are involved with the word and you are listening to the word. You, being ministry is about making you say, "Oh yeah, oh I get it," because the level of your cognizance of what's accurate real and appropriate, the realization of things, your grasp of what's going on is critical for you to engage in a life in Christ. It's not a coincidence the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. I mean, Holy Spirit, I've taught you this before, but you ever wonder why out of all the things the Holy Spirit could be, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth? That's because truth is the main medium of communicating who God is and what God wants and who I'm supposed to be. Everything ties in the truth. That's why the enemy is a liar. That's why his main strategy is to distract and to get you off of that because he knows that's where the spirit is. That's where the power is. And everything God does is initiated and put in motion as a result of you first learning something. There's something to be learned right now. There's something God's trying to show you right now. There's something God is trying to reveal to you. Like, for example, whenever God makes a promise to bless you, okay, and he, he makes a promise so he can provoke you to pursue and want something. The motivation that's provoked by the promise is intended to cause you to learn something because you're not going to receive the promise if you don't learn the lesson. The children of Israel, okay, were delivered from bondage, but they did not learn. Don't worry about the devil. Don't worry about the opposition. Don't worry about the obstacles. Don't worry about the challenges. Got to take care of all of that, okay? What he needs you to do is get what he's trying to tell you. Get what he's trying to teach you. Nothing can prevent you from receiving God's promise more than your failure to learn. And if you can learn what you need to know, you can receive any promise God makes to you. In other words, the most important knowledge you draw from a situation you may be in is what is God teaching me in this situation? Stop, okay. Stop interacting with what's happening and ask yourself, why is God having me to experience this. What is he teaching? There's some acquired knowledge. There's something that he wants me to know. You see, the best knowledge is experiential knowledge. The best knowledge is just not information. It's knowledge you get as a result of an experience. You come to know something that you could not have known if you had not gone through what you went through. You see, in order for something to become internalized, it's got to be personal. It's got to be, it's got to be real. It's got to be a real situation, okay? That brings you to exposing you to truth 
you might not ever notice before, you might never have focused on, you might never have been aware of. And uh, it's like exposure to truth comes into clarity or comes into, into grasp as a result of the kind of situation and conditionings that you're under. And uh, it's possible to come in contact with something and not get it. That's what happened with the children of Israel. They were there, but they never got it. He said, you do always err. And you have not known my ways. Consequently, you will not enter into my rest. And um, he's talking about learning. Learning is how you progress. It's not being around it. Not being exposed to it. It's great you are in the in the house of God. You're in the body of Christ. That's wonderful. But don't stop there. I'm here for a reason. And so it's important that we focus on this. I should ask you ask yourself a question. I know there's a lot going on in my life right now. What's God trying to teach me? What, what, what am I? What am I? What am I supposed to be learning? I mean, how open and receptive am I to how the Word of God can be applied in this situation? I mean. Whatever God reveals is intended for you to use. Let me say that again. Whatever God reveals is intended for you to use. See, he doesn't reveal things to you just so you can know something. I mean, it is fun learning. Wow, I didn't know that, Lord. Okay, he's revealing something to you because he wants you to apply it. He wants you to put it to use. And I can go so far as to say that shortly after God tells you something, you can count on God requiring you to put it to practice. Learning is not merely knowing something. It has everything to do but how much of the word you are actually doing in that situation. Let me tell you something now. This is what Hogos told me this morning. He said the measure of how much you've learned is always and how much more you're doing. Performance is the indication of how much you've actually learned. Not how much you can regurgitate, not how much you can talk, how much you have in your mind, but what am I doing? That's the greatest indication of what you learn. Second indication is what you believe. Now, it's almost equally as important, but I would put doing above it because James even said, you know, he said, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. I mean, making yourself think you're something you're not because you talk the talk, but you ain't doing it. He said, he said, be doers. He said, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The blessing is not in the talking and in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing. But, but I, I don't want you to hear that. And I hear this too. The greatest, well, the second important indication that you're learning is how it affects what you believe. The way that God builds
to you. He gives you insight. All right. There's a direct correlation to how much faith you have as opposed to how much you have learned. That's why God had me to do that faith mindset teaching. That faith mindset teaching was an opportunity to equip you for what's going on in your life right now. That was to give you what you needed to know that when you encounter these situations you presently are in, your reaction will not be to concede and, and just go to complaining and murmuring and just falling apart, but you will believe. You hear me? I mean, what you believe is in direct proportion to what you have learned. Consequently, God prepares you for what he will uh, require of you to believe by teaching you something that you should learn. That's what the Exodus process was about. It was about putting them in the wilderness so that they could learn to rely, to trust, to believe, to know that God was their source and that he was their way maker. When you go to a place where there is nothing there's nothing you could do for yourself. That's what the wilderness was. There was no food there. There was no water there. There was no uh, place to live. There was, I mean, it was just a dust. That's why nobody was in the wilderness. Nobody's in the wilderness because it's inhabitable. I mean, it's not a place where anybody can find water. I mean, it's a, God said, I'm putting you right in there. So you'll know that even though you have nothing in the natural eye, I'm going to be your provision. And uh, I mean, when you look at Jesus and when he was ministering, his main thing with the disciples was for them, for them to learn. I mean, I read some of these accounts, I'd be thinking to myself, man, these dudes right here, because <laughs> they're like us. Because I mean, these guys didn't seem like they was fitted. But Jesus taught them train them. And sometimes, matter of fact, I go so far as to say that the times when Jesus showed the most displeasure was when they were not learning. He didn't have no problem with them making mistakes. He didn't have no problem with them sometimes talking out of turn and all of that. That's not a problem. You know, God doesn't expect you to be perfect. And your humanity is going to get in the way. You lose temper sometimes. You Man, you know, you said, well, I mean, all of that. God doesn't, I mean, the thing that bothers him is when you are not learning, not paying attention, you know? Like when when he um, was disappointed in the disciples, because, I mean, they panicked in that storm. That storm came up, and they were, like, going crazy. Paris, Master, we care, Paris. And Jesus, after he calmed the storm, he said, where in the world is y'all's faith? I expected y'all at this point to act like y'all knew how to believe. Or like the time when he was coming down on Mount Transfiguration and the disciples couldn't cast a demon out of the kid. And Jesus said, oh, faithless generation, how long must I bear with you? In other words, y'all have done this before. What's up with y'all? Why can't y'all cast this demon? Bring the child to me. <laughs> you know? It's like there are times when the disciples just underperformed because, I mean, y'all should be further along than this. Y'all can't pray. And God gave us y'all can't pray with me for an hour. Y'all can't stay awake for, y'all ain't got enough control over your flesh that y'all can't at least pray with me for an hour without going to sleep. I mean, he, he laid them out at the resurrection. He said, oh, fools. He called them fools. Oh, fools and faithless. I mean, what in the world are y'all talking about? Slow to learn. <laughs> he, told, he told Thomas, look, be not faithless. You know better. Come on, Thomas. Because the point is God wants 
your learning to translate into performance over time, proficiency over time. Applying what you're learning to a situation. It's like I said, those two things. Number one, quality of what you do. And then second, quality of what you believe. I know sometimes you feel like a situation took you by surprise. You're like, I can't believe I'm in this situation. Stop thinking that you're in some situation by accident. You're here to apply what you learn and discover what you learn. I hate this. Well, to whom much is given, much is required. And, and I want to, I want to tell you something. The things God has revealed the last couple of years about mindset, all that teach, all let me tell you something. God expects you to be able to handle yourself the challenges you presently face. You know what? When you get teaching like that, God sees greatness in you. God sees potential in you. God has some plans for you. I always tell him he has great plans by what he says to you, how he ministers to you. And I'm going to tell you, I'm a witness because when during that teaching, like in the pandemic and all that, man, God was waking me up two in the morning. Sometimes I didn't sleep at all. And he was just dropping stuff. I'm like, whoa, Lord, there's no way in the world they can get all of this. He said, drop it all on. And I was dropping it like, <laughs> but I want to tell you something. It's because he has great plans for you. And you got to apply what you have learned. You got to recall what you learned. You got to study to show yourself approved a workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly, dividing the word of truth. And uh, you got to connect the dots. You got to think about what a situation is saying to you about the nature of God. And what is this? Uh, that's happening in my life that's connected to what he has been telling me, what he's been saying to me. I mean, it's not about what went wrong or how difficult something is. The point of the situation is I got, I had an opportunity to learn something and now I got to apply what I have learned and I got to use what I have learned. And uh, the word requires you, amen. Don't focus on what you want or what you desire. Don't get caught up in what you want God to bless you with. You focus on the assignment at hand because there's something that this is going to teach me. There's something that I'm going to learn in my time. I guess what I'm saying is allow what's going on in your life right now to shed light into the areas you need to change. Okay? There's some things about the way you are that are, I'm trying to say this nicely, dysfunctional. <laughs> I mean, irrational. I mean, it, it really is impractical for you to be like that if you're going to go to that. I mean, we got to get rid of this self-defeating stuff. We got to stop you uh, being a problem for yourself and having ways that inhibit you from being what God called you to do. You understand me? Like, we got to stop being negative. We got to stop assuming the worst. We got to stop focusing on what I don't have. We got to stop complaining. Stop processing things in a way where you're like, I, I can't get ahead. Stop saying stuff like that out your mouth. You know, I need you to change your whole temperament, your way of being. Well, Pastor G, that's just the kind of person I am. No, it's not the kind of person you are. That's the kind of person you are as a result 
of your life in the world. But now that you're in Christ, it's time for you to be the kind of person who can do great things for God and can accomplish the purpose for why he brought you out of darkness to carry you into his marvelous life. And uh, this isn't just about getting out. This is about getting to the place where he can operate in you and through you. Don't worry about you getting your situation better. You concentrate on getting better. Don't try to change the situation. You try to change so that you can overcome whatever situation you're in. Because God's not ultimately trying to change the situation just so you can be blessed. Some people think, well, I'm waiting for God to move. He is moving. He's moving on you. <laughs> He's changing you. Don't spend so much time praying, God, get me out of this. God, deliver me from it. No. Spend time saying, God, what are you showing me? What are you teaching me? How can I change? That was the problem with the children of Israel. They failed to reach their potential in being equipped to go into the land because they didn't know the promise was as a result of the transformation that would come from them being under the conditions of the wilderness. The entire point of the wilderness was to equip and prepare them so that they could receive the promise. God's dealing with you always with results in mind. He is seeking for you to learn what he's trying to teach you. And I got a lot of time gone, but let me see. Oh man, so much time. Think about it. In school, didn't you have tests? Now, what was the point of the test? The test was to determine whether you had learned the material that the teacher had gone over, right? I mean, that's from a human aspect. And they, they give you a grade. I mean, you either passed or failed based on whether you got the information or not. Well, if that's what they did in school, how much more can you not understand? That's how God works. And the test is not about your demise. It's not about making you uncomfortable. It's not about God just like to see you suffer. The test is, okay, I've given you some information. I've given you some material. Now, this test is, I want you to show me you learned it. I want you to show me you got it. The challenge that you presently face is connected to the specific areas where God needs you to change. And change is always in the context of what you learn. Well, Paul, well, what is it? I think that's James. He said, the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. Patience comes from your faith being put to the test. That you might be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Your deficiencies are exposed so that you can apply the word to overcome those deficiencies. The point of it is for you to come out perfect and entire, not necessarily come out with a better situation or better circumstances. Stop thinking your situation is cursed or because you're having a hardship that somehow or another you missed God or you, you weren't following the word. No, when you follow the word, amen, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And so the exodus is about a process that was imposed on them, intended to change them. I'm close with this. Change them in three ways. That they could be made whole, that they could be made useful, and that they could be made godly. Did you get that? Whole, useful, godly. I'll pick that up next time. I want to talk about those three things. God wants to heal you, he wants to deliver you, and he wants to shape you into his image. It's about you being healed. You see, some people think healing and deliverance is the same thing. It's not. Healing is addressing your trauma, your brokenheartedness. But then he says, 
set at liberty those who are captive. That has to do with the, the functionality, the bondage, the effect of you having been in darkness. And then most of all, making you so that you're pliable so that you could have a quality relationship with him. See, God is holy. And if you're going to be close to him, you have to be holy. I'll stop right there. Manna out. Manna out.